The Denver and Rio Grande Western is by far the longest consecutively operating railroad in Colorado in history. No matter what this railroad had thrown at it, it managed to stick around and proved itself to overall be one of the greatest railroads in the American era. Even when it changed its name to operate under the Southern Pacific name after it merged, it was still America's scenic route at heart. This is the story of the Denver Rio Grande Western Railroad. My name's Jay, and this is the history of Colorado and railroads. The Denver Rio Grande was first chartered on October 12th of 1870 with the intention of creating a north and south link between the major transcontinental railroads to, respectively, the north and the south of Colorado. However, this eventually changed to the railroad mainly building west. Even though it was originally meant to build as far south as El Paso, Texas, the railroad never reached farther than the northern portion of New Mexico. One of the issues that came with expanding towards the west was that they weren't the only railroad who wanted to serve the mining business. Specifically, the Rio Grande had uh, conflicts with the uh, Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe, better known simply as the Santa Fe. Even It got to a point where it was so bad that both sides literally hired gunslingers to fight a, quote, war for them in 1878. Specifically, they fought this war over the Royal Gorge, which today is very, very significant. Anyways, in 1880, the dispute was settled by courts, and the Rio Grande was given the right of way through the canyon. To help facilitate the westward construction of the Rio Grande, they incorporated a separate railway in 1881 in Utah to build the Rhine eastward, known as the Denver Rio Grande Western. This is important. Do not get the Rio Grande and the Rio Grande Western uh, mixed up right now. <laughs> Anyways, in 1883, both railroads linked up, and the Rio Grande set a lease on the Western for 30 years. However, by this point, the railway was under massive financial strain because of the aggressive expansion westward and the building and leasing of the Rio Grande Western. By 1884, the brainchild of the railway, General William Jackson Palmer, who's a really cool dude, by the way, so you should go check him out, was forced to resign as the president of the Rio Grande, but was still director and president of the Rio Grande Western. He, however, resigned as director of the Rio Grande due to a dispute between the Rio Grande and the Western over the agreement. By July of that year, the Rio Grande went, to the, went into receivership and was once again directly taken over by Palmer. However, the Western also fell into receivership and then left Palmer's hands. However, <laughs> the damage had already been done and the Rio Grande fell into foreclosure sale in 1886. British and American stockholders stood up and purchased the company and incorporated it again as the Denver Rio Grande, and they named Palmer as president. In an amazing turn of luck from this whole event, the Rio Grande Western was also released from receivership and went back into Palmer's hands. Palmer stayed with the railroads until 1887 when he stepped down. David Moffat took his spot as president in the company. Uh, Moffat is most well-known because of the famed Moffat Tunnel route through the Rockies that is still actively used today, which is, in fact, an ex-Rio Grande line. More about this later. During Moffat's time at the railroad, the Rio Grande changed its main lines from being narrow-gauged to completely standard-gauged, and the railroad also worked with the Colorado and Midland Railway to create the Rio Grande Junction Railroad, which made a line between Rifle and Grand Junction, Colorado. Moffat left the company in 1891, completely out of anger due to the criticism as he left, ran the railroad. His replacement was named Edward Jeffrey, and was immediately put up to the duty of making the railroad profitable. He actually was very successful at this, and managed to bring the entire railroad into excellent financial condition, so much to the point that during the 1893 Depression, um, it managed to go through it almost completely unscathed, whilst even gigantic railroads such as the Union Pacific went into bankruptcy. Speaking of the Union Pacific, in 1901, General Palmer finally retired his spot on the Rio Grande Western, uh, formerly known as the Denver Rio Grande Western, but somewhere along the line had been reincorporated as the Rio Grande Western, and George Gold, who was the son of Jay Gold, who, uh, if you don't know him, I suggest you go look him up, but he basically turned the Union Pacific into a powerhouse. Anyways, his son became chairman of the board for the Rio Grande. During this time, the Rio Grande purchased a majority of stock in the Rio Grande Western once again, giving it controlling power and reuniting the railroads for the first time after the massive financial collapse in the 1880s. Collapse in the 1880s. Unfortunately for gold, the Union Pacific started denying railroad traffic 
in Utah, which forced Gold's hand in having to expand the railroad even further westwards. Now, what follows in this entire thing has to be the worst implementation for any expansion plan, specifically for railroads, to ever exist. And so, the best way it was decided to go around this expansion plan was to, instead of building westward off of the existing Rio Grande Western, they were going to incorporate a railroad in the west and build east. And so, the Western Pacific was incorporated in 1903 in California. From this point, it was decided that the Denver and Rio Grande would cover every single financial building cost for the Western Pacific, and any overflow costs would be paid for by the Rio Grande Western. Keep in mind, these two companies are basically the same company at this point. So basically, the entirety of the Rio Grande is paying to build the Western Pacific, even though it is technically a separate company. Good job. As to be expected, by 1913, the Denver Rio Grande was so financially stressed that the board of the railroad started to discuss the future. Eventually, this led to court battles between the Denver Rio Grande and the Equitable Trust Company over debts not being paid. In 1916, the Western Pacific was sold off to shareholders and reorganized, basically rendering the entire plan a failure. But the bad luck didn't end here, as the Rio Grande lost its court battles to Equitable Trust and was then instructed to pay $38 million in debt. Only issue being the railroad didn't have $38 million. Um, in the bank at least. But they did have assets. And so, Equitable Trust was given $6.5 million in assets, and later given another $4 million from the sale of the Utah Fuel Company, which was a subsidiary of the railroad. However, all this still wasn't enough to satisfy, satisfy the massive amount of debt, and the railroad was forced into receivership once again. However, in an attempt to avoid receivership on Equitable Trust terms, the railroad went to a minor creditor and started receivership with them. Equitable Trust tried to stop this, but was unsuccessful. As 1917 hit, the U.S. entered World War I, and the Rio Grande started falling under control of the government, which not only complicated the receivership, but stopped the collection of money from Equitable Trust for a little bit. During this time, the government managed to block the efforts of Equitable Trust, but in May of 1918, the court ruled that the Rio Grande had to pay $3.6 million of its debt. This time, however, the Rio Grande did have the money to pay it, specifically coming from $1.5 million that the government had given the railroad because of the uh, whole World War I thingy taking over, um, sales securities, and the cash in the bank. However, when the railroad came out of government control in 1920, it was still in receivership. This still didn't improve the railroad's stance, and by that fall, the railroad was put up for auction again. It was sold in November of that year and reincorporated as the Denver and Rio Grande Western. However, this didn't work either, as foreclosure proceedings began only two years later in 1922 because of the inability to pay for its bonds. Federal judges of the court named Joseph Young, the current president of the railroad, to be the receiver as compared to the bond-holding companies that should have received the railroad due to protests. Furthermore, because of deteriorating conditions of the railroad, special instruction was given to Joseph Young. It is common knowledge that the railroad is badly out of repair. When the case came into this court before, at the time of the forming of the Denver and Rio Grande Western Railroad out of the old Denver Company, the railroad conditions were promising. The Western Pacific Company took the railroad over, but they have done nothing with it. The present owners have not seen fit to keep it in condition, and when it comes into this court, we shall see that it is put in condition, and we shall see that it done before it is turned back to the owners. Furthermore, it will be the policy of this court that no interest shall be paid on the bonds of the road until it is completely rehabilitated and the public thus safeguarded. So, with the issue of the bond payments out of the way, Joseph Young did exactly as he was instructed and poured millions of dollars into the rehabilitation of the railroad, specifically replacement of the rails and the rolling stock. However, even all of this didn't give the railroad good hope, and starting in 1923, the uh, Missouri Pacific and the Western Pacific tried to absorb the line. Kind of ironic. This was, however, stopped by the bondholders, who feared they would be completely wiped out of the equation. They feared this mostly because in the 1920 uh, 
reincorporation, they had been completely wiped out then. So, the Denver and Rio Grande Western was given a reorganization plan by the ICC in December of 1923. And in October of the following year, the railroad was sold to the reorganization managers, one of which was Equitable Trust. The new president of the railroad was named as J.S. Pite. I'm pretty sure. P Piat? Pite? Piat? I don't... something. During this time, the railroad was busy with construction as well. Starting in 1923, the famed Moffat Tunnel, hey, look, we talked about this earlier, started construction and was finally finished in 1927. If you remember, David Moffat was current was a rail. If you remember, David Moffat was a president of the railroad back in 1987 to 1991, I believe. Anyways, he finally got his dream after he poured millions of dollars into it, but never got anything from it, and he unfortunately didn't get to see it in person as he died in 1911. But it eventually did come to fruition. That wasn't the only part, though, as Without the Dot Cerro cutoff, which was completed in 1934, the Moffat Tunnel would have been created for no reason. Originally, the plan was to build the line in a westward fashion up towards Craig, Colorado, and then meet up with Salt Lake City, Utah, eventually. However, this would have been a lot of money, which would not have been great for the time, especially since it was during the middle of the Depression. So what was was eventually decided was that instead of going through Craig, they would just build a line up to Craig, and they would run a cutoff through the railroad to meet up with the already existing main line to go towards Salt Lake. And so this happened, and ta-da! It finally had a direct line to Salt Lake City from Denver. However, with all this being completed, the Rio Grande was still not doing great financially, and in 1935, the railroad was back in court trying to get another reorganization under reorganizationable uh, bankruptcy. The government then appointed two men as co-trustees to help out the railroad as part of the reorganization plan. And wow, they actually did a lot of help. So these two men were named Wilson McCarthy and Henry Swan, and in only two years they invested $18 million into improving the company. And by 1939, only two years after the $18 million had been invested, the railroad had had massive recovery and was starting to just climb upwards with its profitability. And it only continued into the 40s, especially with World War II. In 1947, the trusteeship of McCarthy and Swan ended and the railroad was returned to private again following the reorganization plan from 12 years earlier. The Missouri Pacific and the Western Pacific, once again back at it, trying to ruin the Grin Rio Grande's life, both tried to oppose the plan, going as far to the Supreme Court with the case, but they were unsuccessful and got shot down. The ICC established a new board of directors for the Rio Grande, and McCarthy returned to the railroad as president. During McCarthy's time, passenger traffic decreased, but the freight traffic steadily increased, Part of this being because of McCarthy's persistence to keep developing the agriculture and industry in and around the Rio Grande. He had a strong grip on the railroad until he died in 1956. He was replaced by Gail Idlot, who continued McCarthy's policies and stepped up in the improvement of the line. Specifically, he started saving costs on passenger services by either reducing them where seen necessary or straight out eliminating them. He also improved the communications technology and the locomotives used by the railroad. In 1969, Rio Grande Industries Incorporated was established as a means of expanding the railroad into other industries as well, and by 1970, the company was invested in real estate development, industrial contracting, and insurance. The 1970s also saw a massive decline in passenger service all around the nation, but also on the Rio Grande, as air travel and private cars started to explode. The Rio Grande dealt with this by completely eliminating all passenger service except for the Rio Grande Zephyr, which is more commonly known as the California Zephyr. It would run three times a week between Denver and Salt Lake City, and in 1983, the California Zephyr slash Rio Grande Zephyr was finally retired and Amtrak completely took over passenger services for the Rio Grande. Back to 1997, Idlot stepped down as the president of the line and became chairman. His successor? Successor, his successor was W.J. Holtman. In Idlot's time, he had brought the freight revenue on the road to an all-time high of $305 million annually. 
From 1984 to 1987, a businessman from Denver by the name of Philip Anschutz purchased enough stock in the company to be considered owner, and he took the publicly held company private. In 1988, he purchased one-third of all the Southern Pacific Railroad stock and managed to merge the two railroads together. However, it was decided for the publicity purposes that the two railroads would operate under the Southern Pacific's name, but at heart, it still operated as the Rio Grande. In fact, there was still a little bit left over from the time. The uh, Southern Pacific used to use a kind of Sanskrit type font, and when the Rio Grande took over, they swapped over to the speed lettering that the Rio Grande used. However, our story finally comes to an official end in 1995, when Philip reached an agreement with the Union Pacific and merged the two railroads together to restore the Union Pacific as the largest railroad in the United States. The deal was then approved one year later in 1996. However, the Rio Grande isn't completely gone. It still lives on in our hearts, but it also lives on in some scenic railroads in Colorado. So, there's the Royal Gorge Railway, the Cumbers and Toltec, and the Durango and Silverton for the most part. Uh, the Royal Gorge runs some older passenger units in the Rio Grande scheme, and the Durango and Silverton and the Cumbers and Toltec both run... Uh, old steam locomotives, don't remember the type, but, you know, they run actual authentic Rio Grande steam locomotives and rolling stock. And me being a Coloradan, I would recommend that you guys, if you ever are here, go and take a trip to these scenic railroads and have a good time on them and just enjoy the history because the Rio Grande's like a freaking amazing railroad. Anyways, hope you guys enjoyed this video. You know, you gotta, you gotta smash that like button. <laughs> I hate myself for saying that. Anyways, See you around.